This physics of Bitcoin episode will consist of two parts, so make sure to stay tuned for the next video as well. After being Bitcoiners for many years, we have come to the conclusion that people have a lot of misconceptions on how Bitcoin works. Let's break down one of the biggest misconceptions. You could say that there are two different worlds of understanding when it comes to attributing the fundamental driving forces behind Bitcoin's value. The first worldview is a scarcity-based idea, where people are greedily fighting over scarce resources to secure their own well-being. This vision isn't just unintentionally bleak and unappreciative of Bitcoin's true nature, it is also not supported by empirical evidence. We have already demonstrated that there is no correlation between issuance and price. We have many videos on why stock to flow is wrong, and we will include some links in the description. Now, we're not against the idea of Bitcoin having a fixed supply. On the contrary, this non-dilutive quality is extremely important for Bitcoin to retain the true driving factor behind its increase in valuation and avoid the pitfalls of flawed, fiat-based monetary systems. In fact, this property reminds us of one of the most fundamental concepts in physics that is called the principle of conservation that can be used for energy, momentum, charge, and in Bitcoin's case, the conservation of money. We will elaborate on this idea in a future Physics of Bitcoin episode. What is this true driving factor for the growth of Bitcoin then? Here is where the second worldview comes into play. Unlike the first one, this second worldview is not based on faith and trying to fit evidence to justify a flawed understanding akin to increasingly sophisticated geocentric models of the past. Bitcoin has all of the information available, you just have to know where to look. In short, we have arrived at the conclusion that even though Bitcoin is many things, at its core it is a network that involves humans and machines. The humans form a social network and the machines form a computer network. These two form a synergy by interacting with each other. In our model, we use the number of Bitcoin addresses with non-zero balances as a proxy for nodes in the network, while transactions between addresses represent links. As adoption and size of the network increases, so does the value of the network. This is where the second misconception comes into play. This growth is often mistakenly depicted as an S-curve, which is true for most tech adoption, but not in the case of Bitcoin. I'm sure you have all seen these we are here charts where people put a randomly placed dot on an S-curve. This approach is completely unscientific and lacks any predictive power. First, let's see what S-curve based adoption looks like. As you can see, S-curve adoption can also be depicted as a bell curve chart, which is commonly used for depicting a dataset's normal distribution of values. The blue line on this chart represents a bell curve, while the yellow curve represents the sum or an integral when using the mathematical term. This is not just a random curve, it is a precise equation that is usually exponential. The adoption of an innovation commonly follows an S-curve when plotted over a length of time. Categories of adopters are innovators, early adopters, early majority, late majority, and laggards. You have got to be kidding me. In addition to the gatekeepers and opinion leaders who exist within a given community, change agents may come from outside the community as well. They bring innovations to new communities, first through the gatekeepers, then through the opinion leaders, and so on through the community. The bell curve is useful because it shows how many people there are relative to these adopter groups. The peak of the curve is the average, or the majority of the people. By the middle point, 50% of the people have already adopted the technology, which means that we have reached a peak. When we go down again, the relative number of people who don't have the technology goes down as well. Now, if you sum the total, this is how you get the S-curve. The exponential decelerates after the middle of the curve. 100 represents the ceiling, or the asymptote, which indicates maximum market saturation. This is not what Bitcoin's adoption looks like though. Instead, it is a power law, as illustrated by the number of addresses, as the best proxy for adoption. How did we arrive here though? As you may know, Giovanni first discovered the power law between price and addresses in 2013, 
when he wrote this article comparing Bitcoin to Metcalfe's law. Before this discovery, Giovanni actually thought that Bitcoin did follow an S-curve. The evidence proved him wrong, however, because depicting it as such would have been like fitting a square peg into a round hole. It is a very precise evolution that follows a power law instead. He then discovered the power law between hash rate and price. Once Giovanni started looking into the on-chain parameters, he discovered that they are all connected power laws. Giovanni delved deeper into the topic and started looking for other articles on similar phenomena, even finding the parallels between the spread of viruses and Bitcoin. This is the only virus you want to be infected by though, and the earlier, the better. How does this virus-like growth of Bitcoin adoption affect the price of Bitcoin? Well, this is where the power law between price and addresses comes into play. The data shows that there is a relationship between price and addresses, where price is proportional to addresses squared. This relationship is a demonstration of a theoretical result in network theory called Metcalfe's Law. Metcalf is an engineer and one of the pioneers of the internet, who discovered that the value of the network is proportional to the links of the network, which in turn are proportional to the square of the nodes. But what even is a network? A network is a system of interconnected points, called nodes, linked by edges or links. Nodes can represent people, devices, or even cells, while edges are the relationships or pathways between them. Networks can have different structures like clusters of tightly connected nodes or hubs that serve as central points. Some connections are mutual and undirected, while others flow one way and are thus directed. Networks help us understand complex systems, from social media interactions to computer communications, by showing how information or influence moves through interconnected parts. When it comes to Bitcoin, it is both a social network and a network of machines. A social network is a social structure made up of a set of social actors and the connections between them and other social interactions between the actors. The social network perspective provides a set of methods for analyzing the structure of whole social entities, explaining the patterns observed in those structures. The study of these structures uses social network analysis to identify local and global patterns, local influential entities, and examine network dynamics. By using this network approach, we can better understand the price dynamics of Bitcoin. In fact, by using this network approach and combining the growth of addresses in time and how the price reacts to the growth of the addresses, we can then better understand the price dynamics in time. The behavior in time can be described by combining two network properties, the virus-like growth of the nodes or addresses and how the price of Bitcoin, which is proportional to the value of the network, responds to the growth of the links, or in other words, the nodes squared. Giovanni then did an exhaustive literature research for his discovery that Bitcoin behaves like a network. One of the most relevant papers on this topic is titled On Power Law Growth of Social Networks. As you can see from the graph, they studied different networks, which turned out to be power laws. The only difference between our and their representation of power laws is that they represented them in a log linear instead of a log log fashion. This means that the x axis is linear while the y axis is logarithmic. The only exception to this is the right column, which represents the data in the more familiar log log fashion. In addition, the graphs show both the nodes and the links. In this case, the nodes are the people, while the connections between the people are links, and they're represented by the letters N and E, respectively. The reason why links are represented by the letter E is because the technical term for them is actually edges. In short, all of these graphs of social networks show the relationship between edges and nodes. Now, the reason why most of these examples are Chinese is because the authors of the article are Chinese scholars. You might think that Enron is a terrible example to use in the same context as Bitcoin, considering what happened to it, but it's actually a great example of what can happen to a power law in the rare case where things go terribly wrong. As you can see, they looked at emails before, during, and after the bankruptcy, and the reason they had access to this information is because it is all public. 
As you probably know by now, power laws are usually very resilient, but even power laws can be derailed when the fundamentals turn out to be terrible. Giovanni reproduced the same graph describing the growth of nodes and links in the first chart, the change in these quantities over time in the second chart, and the relationship between links and nodes called network densification in the third chart. This is a perfect example of Metcalfe's law. You can also see the close resemblance between Bitcoin and the other examples of social networks. In our next Physics of Bitcoin video, we will delve deeper into the math of network theory, visualize the growth of Bitcoin's user base, and even find out when we will reach hyper-Bitcoinization, so stay tuned. This is Saverio speaking, and as always, thanks for watching.